This little pill looks like the real thing, but it's not. It's a fake laced with fentanyl and taking just one pill can be deadly. It's not only phony prescription medications. Fentanyl is hiding in many illicit and seemingly legal drugs and killing as many as 150 people a day. As the crisis worsens, the question becomes, what can be done to save lives? We'll talk to national experts and get the answers on hope and healing, exposing the fentanyl crisis town hall. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel. Welcome to Hope and Healing, exposing the fentanyl crisis town hall. I'm Olga Villaverde, and joining me is Dr. Michael Zinner, CEO and Executive Medical Director of Miami Cancer Institute and Baptist Health Cancer Care. Olga, we mentioned in the intro that there are 150 deaths a day due to fentanyl. This really is a crisis, and it's hitting all ages and economic groups, and the sad fact is most of these are preventable. In many cases, the victims don't even know that they're taking a drug that could kill them. This is so sad. You're right, Dr. Zinner, and that's why we're here, to help people understand what's really going on. So before we introduce our panel of experts, let's take a look at this public service announcement released by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention about the dangers of fentanyl. The drug landscape has changed. Illegal fentanyl has made its way into the drug supply and it's a danger you might not see coming. A synthetic opioid up to 50 times stronger than heroin, up to 100 times stronger than morphine. It only takes the tiniest amount to cause a fatal overdose, a fraction of a raindrop, or three grains of salt. Your drugs don't come with an ingredients list. Although fentanyl is being mixed into almost every kind of drug, you wouldn't be able to see it, or smell it, or taste it. Fentanyl is one of the most common drugs involved in overdose deaths. Know the dangers. Learn the facts about fentanyl and ways to protect yourself at cdc.gov slash stop overdose. We're here to unpack why and how this is happening. So let's introduce our panel of experts who will help make sense of this crisis. Let's start with Dr. Jeffrey Borenstein. He is the president and CEO of the Brain and Behavior Research Foundation and host of the PBS program, Healthy Minds. Dr. Patricia Ares Romero is president and CEO of Ares Associates Consulting and a board member of the National Alliance on Mental Illness in Miami-Dade County. James Carroll is the former director of National Drug Control Policy and a partner at Frost Brown Todd Attorneys. And Dr. Ronette Lev is an emergency and addiction physician and host of High Truths on Drugs and Addiction podcast. Welcome to all of you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. And thank you for being here. Our pleasure. I want to remind our viewers that if you have a question for our panel, please email it to us right there to questions at allhealthtv.com. That's questions at allhealthtv.com. We would love to hear from you. You know, Dr. Zinner, that CDC video that said a dose of fentanyl, as little as three grains of salt, three grains of salt can kill someone. I just can't get over that. That's amazing to me also. It's frightening, Olga. Dr. Bornstein, many people may have heard about fentanyl, but don't really know what it is. Could you explain what type of drug it is and what it's approved for use? For example, I know we've been using it in anesthesia and surgery for 30 years. Exactly right. Fentanyl, there's two types. There's the type that are made by pharmaceuticals companies and are prescribed by doctors as a pain medicine for people with severe pain, maybe people with cancer. It needs to be prescribed very carefully. And then there's the illicit form of fentanyl that is streaming into our country, and that's causing so much of this problem. And it's very frightening. 
Thank you, Dr. Borenstein. Dr. Aris, let me turn to you. How does fentanyl affect a person's body? Uh, does it produce a high? So yeah, so fentanyl, like the doctor said, is, is an opioid, it's a synthetic opioid. So it works like heroin would or morphine. So at the beginning, there's gonna be a euphoria, a feeling of happiness. And of course, those things can escalate to worse of, of things such as you know respiratory distress, um, hypoxia of the brain, um, sedation, um, constipation, things like that, that are really the bad sides of, of this fentanyl, um, which can really lead to death. And as we've seen these overdoses. Dr. Lev, if someone takes a drug laced with fentanyl, how quickly can they overdose with it? Our medical examiner has seen people with half a pill still left in their hand when they died. Fentanyl stops your breathing, and with no air, your heart will stop, and then you could die in minutes. Everybody's metabolism and physical health is different. And people who are lucky enough to come reach me in the emergency department after an overdose can be completely fine as if nothing happened or could end up on a ventilator or in a coma. My goodness, thank you so much for that. It's just too tragic here. And, and that's why it's important to have this town hall, Mr. Carroll. There's so many people that are not aware of it. And like Dr. Zinner said, there's an approved use for fentanyl. But where is illicit fentanyl coming from? Yeah, sadly, what we know today is that all of the illicit drugs, especially fentanyl, is coming in from outside the United States. It is primarily originating in China, a few other source countries, but primarily China making its way to Mexico and then coming across from, again, primarily Mexico into the U.S. as a finished product. So it's already fentanyl. More and more, it's pressed into a fake pill that you mentioned. And these pills are so perfect. Um, it's hard even for the manufacturers to distinguish a pill just by looking at it. So anyone on the street does not have a chance. Thank you, Mr. Carroll. And you know, Dr. Zinner, um, the number of overdoses attributed to fentanyl are overwhelming. I want to show you and our viewers, the rest of the panel, everyone, some of these numbers. Take a look at this. According to the National Safety Council, fentanyl was involved in over 67,000 preventable overdoses in 2021. Over 67,000. And that was a 26% increase from 2020. So our next video involves a mother who lost her son from a fentanyl overdose. I want to warn our viewers, this can be very difficult to watch. We ended up finding out that he took a pill that he thought was um, an oxy, and um, and it was fentanyl. It was pure fentanyl. Joshua, um, he was adorable. <laughs> we had the first week of school, and it was fantastic. Um, Joshua was so excited about being, you know, a freshman in high school. I was going out of town the next day. And then the next morning, I woke up, got ready, you know, had everything ready to go. Um, my suitcases were on the front porch, and at the last minute, I thought, I need to run upstairs and say bye to Joshua. I couldn't wake him up. And the minute I touched him, I knew. He was ice cold. His room was always really cold. And I kept thinking, um, oh my God, if I could just warm him up. It just, we just need to warm him up, you know? And, um, and he'll be okay, and he was laying like on his side, and I kept trying to lean down and like, you know, see his face, and I was touching him and rubbing him, and and it was just, it was just horrible to to see all that and never forget it. Joshua's pill was pure fentanyl. We don't know if this was Joshua's first pill or his tenth pill. But 
that's the game you're playing. Nobody's invincible. Don't think it can't happen to you because guess what? Nobody thinks it can happen to them. And it happened to us. Did I ever dream in a million years I could lose my only child like this? No. Never once did I think that my kid was going to take something that was going to kill him. That is just heartbreaking. Um, that's difficult to watch. It's heartbreaking. So devastating. Let me repeat that line. One pill can kill. One pill can kill. Um, we spoke to uh, Agent Mark Scuffington. He's the deputy special agent in charge of the Miami Field Division for the DEA, and he covers Dr. Zinner the entire state of Florida. Let's take a listen to what he has to say. Fake pills and illicit fentanyl is the most urgent drug threat to our communities uh, at the present time. To our communities, to our kids, to our families, um, Americans uh, are dying at, at an unprecedented rate uh, due to these uh, poisonings. Uh, last year, um, over 100,000 Americans were lost uh, to, to uh, poisonings and overdoses. And, and those are largely attributed to uh, a synthetic opioid like fentanyl. Mr. Carroll, uh, I'd be interested in your thoughts on what we just heard. First off, our, you know, obviously our hearts go out to Joshua's family. Sadly, there's another 120,000 families this year that are going to face that same tragedy. And so it can't just be our love and thoughts are with you. There needs to be a call to action. We need to recognize this for what it is. These are truly foreign terrorist organizations. These are drug traffickers that are pushing poison into our countries. And we need to have a whole of government approach in going after this. We have to recognize that we're losing an entire generation. It's the fastest rising cause of death for teenagers, the number one cause of death for 18 to 45 year olds. Um, you know, many are likening this to a weapon of mass destruction. And I certainly don't disagree with that at this point. And so it requires the entire government to focus in on education, the one pill can kill, on making good treatment available and we have to make sure that we're stopping the flow of drugs into our country. Dr. Bornstein, why did fentanyl become the drug of choice to be laced with other drugs? You know, the, the strength of fentanyl is the cause of the problem. So what they are able to do is take a little bit, those few grains of salt that we heard about and put it in other drugs so as that drug has a strong effect. And this is what's so scary about it. Somebody's taking this, they don't even know that they're taking fentanyl. They don't know that they're risking their life in this way. Part of the point of this show today is to get the word out there that whatever kind of illicit drug you may be taking, you're putting yourself at risk because of fentanyl. Thank you, Dr. Borenstein. Dr. Lev, I wanna give you a question that I just received from a viewer. Uh, from Facebook, and this viewer writes, can an overdose be identified as fentanyl even if other drugs are present? Could you take that one for me, please? Yes, thank you, great question. Um, most drug overdoses are polydrugs. So we, we, we know that. Um, most people who die of fentanyl probably have something else in their system. But what killed you, the final death, is most likely fentanyl because of the way it acts, because it stops your breathing. Um, if there's methamphetamine or cocaine or marijuana or other drugs, those act um, together. They, they all work in decreasing your central nervous system and how it acts. But the final kill, usually, if fentanyl is on board, it is a fentanyl. Thank you, Dr. Lev. Mr. Carroll, what is the co most common way, I guess is my question, most common way fentanyl is mixed with other drugs, pills, powder, or even liquid for that matter? Yeah, as Dr. Lev said, we're seeing it really in, in all forms. And the pills seem to be the one. I just did sort of a status check, um, checking with um, some law enforcement friends across the country. Pills are still the number one source of the problem. Um, but more and more, you know, these pills are either being crumbled up 
um, and put into other drugs. And so it's very concerning, you know, what we're seeing out there, because truly a lot of these are not overdoses. As they said at the beginning, these are poisonings. These are children who not don't understand what they're doing. They don't know what they're taking. They think they're, you know, maybe taking an Adderall to help them get their exams or something to help them with a party. You know, they think that will um, increase the uh, atmosphere at the party and they don't realize that they're actually being exposed and if not killed by fentanyl coming into the country. Dr. Lev, uh, as we mentioned earlier, uh, fentanyl had a real medical use for a long time. Now, you deal with emergencies. And when did we or you become aware of the crisis? And how long did it take before you realized that this was so out of control in the public? Yeah, and you're right. I actually prescribe and use fentanyl in my daily practice at the emergency department. The emergency department is the canary in the coal mine for society's problems. In 2015, illicit fentanyl hit the market, the drug market, but it was not as bad as the opioid prescription crisis. And in 2019, we were finally getting a handle on the opioid prescription problem, and boom, illicit fentanyl superseded anything we ever dealt with with prescription opioids. When the pandemic hit, I was covered head to toe with PPE standing by for the expected tsunami of COVID patients, and I was really nervous to intubate my first COVID patients. But my first pandemic intubation was not COVID. It was a young girl who overdosed on a fake fentanyl pill, and tragically, she died. In San Diego, where I practice, we're close to the border where drugs are flowing in and our medical examiners reporting two and a half deaths a day of fentanyl, and that is indeed out of control. And as um, Mr. Carroll said, it's the number one cause of death, ages 18 to 45, according to Families Against Fentanyl. Dr. Aries, let's look at the same question from a different perspective. You deal with addiction. How can you help us understand how this came into effect with the addiction community? Yeah, so, so for us, we saw it pretty early on. Um, in 2017 was the opioid crisis. We were pulled into the mayor task force to really get it off the streets. Um, and so in 2018 is when we were really seeing it. You know, Miami-Dade County, um, working at one of the largest public health hospitals, we were seeing it in the emergency room. Um, so much so that we're telling our patients, please do not take anything that you're not really sure of, because that's when we knew the fentanyl was coming in power form and they were bringing in um, pill presses from Canada and that's how they were doing it down in, in South Florida. So it was a very scary situation, um, you know, trying to prevent our patients from dying um, was our biggest um, issue in Dade County. Dr. Aris, let me stay with you and ask you this. Fentanyl deaths occur throughout society, but what's happening in underserved community? Is the crisis as bad there? So it's, it's very sad because, you know, there's really this disparity of treatment uh, for underserved communities. So the fact that they don't have the access to treatment for the addiction is, is really one of the biggest issues. And also they don't have access to naltrexone, or I'm sorry, naloxone, um, in order to reverse an opioid um, overdose if, if it's there. Um, so hopefully now with the opioid settlement, the money coming in to the states, um, <laughs> have more access to education, prevention, and hopefully a lot of treatment. Mr. Carroll, I, I want to look at this from a little bit of a different direction. You're the former director of the National Drug Control Policy for the White House. So you know how hard it is yes. to handle a crisis like this. How do we stem the tide? Well, I think I also come to you as a parent of a child in recovery from a dependence on opioids. And I'm, I'm very blessed. Um, our child is six years into recovery from her dependence. And what it's important to sort of approach with that mindset that these are everyone's children. This really can be your child, your grandchild, the person next door to you. This is not limited to any one demographic. And so it's important that we get help to everyone. And I think that's really, when we talk about stemming the tide, it's that we build the awareness we make sure that the treatment that people are getting is accessible, but it's also really good treatment. And I think that's one of the important things to recognize. I, I just saw recently that Florida joined half or maybe a dozen other states um, with a treatment locator called treatmentatlas.org. And so, so many other you know, states are banding together and working as a country to tackle this issue. 
And that's really what I think we need to do is work together, public-private partnerships to make sure um, that we're doing everything possible to save lives. Thank you, you know, Mr. Carroll. We're fortunate we have some Facebook questions coming in. So, Oda? I have one here, and this is what the viewer writes. I'm a pastor's wife in South Florida who just lost my baby brother to f a fentanyl overdose, and I'm so very sorry. Um, he thought it was Xanax. Mm. Dr. Lev, can you uh, help us answer that question for so that So sad, Dr. Lev. So, I, I, well, my heart goes out for you, and this is why we're here talking about this, and thank you to the show is, and it's not fair. I feel like your brother was murdered. He didn't intend to take fentanyl and die. Uh, he thought he was taking Xanax. He, he was anxious if he was, that's what he was going through, and that's just not right, and that's why we have to have a strong first to dealing with this problem, tackle it like we did COVID. You know, we had an all-government approach on all ends to deal with this virus, and we should be dealing the same type of fourth to deal with fentanyl because that's just not right. And I'm so, so sorry uh, for your loss. It's, it's, it's preventable. And it's not fair. No, it's not fair at all. We actually have another viewer question, Dr. Zinner, uh, a Facebook viewer, and this viewer writes, do you believe over-the-counter, this is a great question, do you believe over-the-counter Narcan will make a dent in the fentanyl crisis. Let's go to Mr. Carroll. Can you help us with that one? Well, um, so Narcan is one of the brands that's available. There's a concern, um, at least that I have, that Narcan, the, brown, the brand itself, is only a four milligram. And with fentanyl, these drugs getting stronger and stronger, um, we need to respond you know, with all of the available naloxones. There's, um, I mean, certainly the Narcan, I think most people are familiar with, you know, it's an, a nasal injection. There's also Zimhi, which is an intermuscular, um, like an EpiPen. And so we need to make sure that all of these different brands are out there and people have access to them. And Mr. Carroll, quick follow-up. Are these available over the counter so we can educate our viewers? All of them, all the ones that you mentioned. Um, so what, thankfully right now there's a standing order in all 50 states and all the territories of the U.S so that anyone can walk into any pharmacy anywhere and get naloxone of any variety. Um, my successor, um, Dr. Raul Gupta at the White House has done a great job. He is making it over the counter, um, working with the rest of the government. I expect that to happen this fall. I, the real issue is, is it accessible? Is it affordable? And do we know where it is? And the fact that it will be over the counter doesn't mean that it's free, right? People still have to go into a pharmacy or a drugstore um, or maybe hopefully even a convenience store and be able to buy this. But, you know, for someone who has a severe addiction, are they going to spend the money to have naloxone available, you know, to them? People with a severe addiction are, you know, selling everything they own, sadly selling themselves. And so, you know, it, it's really, it's, what's important is to make sure that everyone has naloxone, that it's ubiquitous. I mean, we, everyone has hopefully at their home, a first aid kit, um, and some bandages, they have a fire extinguisher in their kitchen. It, this needs to be the same thing. We need to have naloxone in schools. We need to have it everywhere um, where anyone might need it. You, you know, it's got, I, I've got to follow up on that because it, it is, is this a sign of the times? Is this going to be able to make a difference in a crisis that we're facing where our children are dying from a single pill? Dr. Aris, would you like to take that? I, I think yes. I think access to having naloxone I, is very important. Um, everybody should have it. I agree with Jim 100%. It should be accessible and we should be able to give it to the people that need it. Um, when I started medication treatment program at, at Jackson, we gave it to every patient that walked in through the door. We, had, we taught the families how to use it and we made sure that everybody had access to it. Um, it, was a, a, it was a fund that we got from um, from the state, but I think it's very important that there's access. Dr. Lev, I'd like you to chime in on this if possible. I, I don't think that naloxone will... Yeah, so naloxone is essential. Before you, in order to prevent someone from dying, you give naloxone, but that's not, we're not gonna naloxone our way out of the fentanyl crisis. By the time you get naloxone, you're like this close to being in the morgue. We need upstream solutions, both in supply and demand. Um, it doesn't take away from the importance from naloxone, but if we really wanna tackle this problem, 
like we tackled COVID, why we tackle anything that's really important, like we tackled the prescription opioid epidemic, you need to go upstream from naloxone, both in supply and the demand. All right, so let, Dr. Bornstein, I'm gonna ask you some of the same kind of questions. We're talking about how to stem the tide, how to change the, the, the narrative here, how to make this crisis at least a, a manageable one like we did with COVID. Your thoughts on that? Yeah, great question. There's not one solution as we're hearing from our panel. So the Narcan and the other forms, that's one part of it. That's saving lives, that's doing CPR. But we also try to avoid people from needing CPR by treating it upstream. So we need to have, first of all, education. Our children need to learn about the risk of taking drugs. It's not just the risk that we all might have learned when we were growing up, the risk is now greater because the drugs are being poisoned with fentanyl. So you're not taking what you think you're taking. Also, our kids need to learn that recovery is possible. And Jim, you sharing your family's good experience counterweighs the tragedy that we heard about Joshua and the person who wrote in from, from face, Facebook, the, that there are positive stories. People can become addicted and get into recovery with appropriate treatment. We need to get that message across very strongly. Thank you so much, Dr. Bornstein. Uh, I have another question uh, from a viewer on Facebook, and I'm gonna try to make it out because it's not very clear, but how can someone be charged with selling a fake pill that is fentanyl that killed this person? We have messages and know this scum sold it to him. Police are not helping. Okay, so I got the gist of it, right. um, and it's a very good question. Let's go to... Dr. Lev? Dr. Lev, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think that's a law enforcement uh, question, not an emergency addiction doctor question. Um, but I, I think it's right. We, it's part of deterrence. There need to be deterrence and um, for, for selling drugs that kill people. And uh, I mean, I would, I would give that to our law enforcement um, colleagues to, to, that's part of upstream prevention. It's not just treatment, but it's also the deterrence of having these drugs available to kill people. Yeah. Mr. Carroll, that's a, an absolute follow-up for you. That, I was just gonna say, that's an absolute good follow-up for you, sir. Yeah, I mean, I was um, very fortunate in my position at the White House to oversee the $35 billion the federal government spends on this issue. About 48% of that is on the law enforcement side, and I directly oversaw about $300 million in federal law enforcement funds um, in giving grants out directly from my office to the high intensity drug trafficking um, groups across the country. On, on this issue, thankfully, more and more law enforcement and more and more communities are recognizing, like what we saw in that horrifying video with Joshua's death, is that that is a murder scene. Um, and the police are investigating it like that. They're looking for evidence. Um, they're being very careful. They're seizing the phones. They're looking at every possible way that this, you know, poor Joshua, you know, got these drugs. Maybe he was searching for drugs. Maybe he wasn't. And that's what we're finding out. And so the, the law enforcement is taking this very seriously. God bless the men and women of law enforcement and our first responders um, who are getting there and trying to do everything in their power to keep them alive until they can bring them to the emergency department um, to see these fine physicians that are on the panel with me. But what we need to do is, is to really recognize what's happening and get the law enforcement at that end. And Dr. Love, of course, is, is right as always, um, that this is upstream. This is everything that we're talking about um, is being able to look at this holistically. There's no simple solution. Thank you so much, Mr. Carroll. Uh, another question from a viewer on Facebook. I so appreciate these questions. Really good ones, Dr. Zinner. This one writes, I got Narcan free through end overdose. You can do a short online course. Again, that's end overdose. Dr. Harris, can you help us? Yes. So, um, so it depends on the state, um, what the ability of, of the uh, naloxone is. Uh, we were able to get some funds through the state of Florida to be able to, to hand it out. Um, I know DCF has as well. So I think it depends on each state. I believe with the opioid dollars that are coming in, I'm sure they're gonna be using some of that. Um, but I do agree with the panel. I think, you know, this is a multi-pronged approach to treatment. Um, you know, I, my expertise is in treating um, addiction and wellness. 
And so, so we do need to have good evidence-based treatments for, for all those who have um, an addiction uh, to substance use or substance use disorder, properly said. Um, but it's important for us to have conversations with our children because this is much larger than in the open crisis. This is something that they're being fooled and given things that they don't even know they're actually taking fentanyl. So imagine how scary for that Facebook comment of someone that said that, you know, that, that they thought they were taking Xanax. Um, you know, how scary. So it's it's much larger than just substance use disorder. We're talking about these overdoses that should be prevented, that shouldn't be happening. Thank you, Dr. Aris. Uh, Dr. Borenstein, I want to follow up with you then. So if a we parent have... believes that a child is illicitly buying a drug, right, and what should they look for? And, and how do you handle it? And how do you start that conversation? Because, you know, she just made a great point about that. Uh, great question. So I would say two things. First of all, if you're concerned about your child, you should ask them. And in a very straightforward way, not in a critical way, but in a concern. Just as if you saw that your child was suddenly walking with a limp, you'd say, did you injure your leg? What's going on? What can we do to help? Part two of my answer is we need to begin these conversations before the issue starts. At a young age, we need to start to teach our children about these risks. And especially now, as more and more we're seeing states make marijuana legal, so it sort of gives a green light to drug use in some ways, we as parents need to speak about these dangers and about the fact that you may buy such and such pill, think it's such and such, but it could kill you because it isn't. And we need to have these conversations on a regular basis, starting at a young age. You know, almost as a follow-on to that, we, we said that fentanyl crisis is affecting people of all ages and economic groups. That's right, Dr. Zinner. And one group that is being hit very hard is young people, especially teens and children. According to data published by JAMA Pediatrics, more than 5,000 children and teens have died from overdoses involving fentanyl in the past two decades. More than half of those deaths happened in the first two years of the COVID pandemic. Dr. Harris, what are some of the reasons the pandemic caused a surge in teen overdoses? So it's, it's, it's been thought that one of the largest reasons was that the kids came home, 40% of these overdoses were kids that already had some sort of mental illness, had had some kind of mental issue. And so what's believed that most of these children, the access to mental health is usually in the schools and not being at school um, could have caused some of this. The wide availability of the fentanyl is another thing. It's very economical, the illicit fentanyl. Uh, there's a much larger access to it. So those are some of the theories that uh, have been said to, um, especially through the NIDA, um, that have been the reasons why this this huge spike. It was actually a, over a hundred percent increase during the pandemic. Oh, Olga, one of the biggest problems uh, involving teens and young adults is they think they're buying a prescription medication like Xanax or Adderall on the Internet through familiar websites. But in fact, it's really they're getting fakes. That's right, Dr. Zinner. We asked Agent Skeffington about how widespread fakes are. Here's what he had to say. Let me provide this statistic. In, in, in 2022, DEA seized more than 50 million fentanyl-laced fake prescription pills and more than 10,800 pounds of fentanyl powder. So the DEA lab estimates those seizures represent more than 379 million potential deadly doses of fentanyl. Just two milligrams of fentanyl, uh, the amount that would fit on the, on the tip of a pencil, uh, contains potentially a, a lethal dose. Um, the DEA lab uh, informs that um, six out of 10 pills that are seized um, potentially contain a deadly dose of fentanyl. So people who are looking for medications don't even have to leave home. That's right. All they need to do is reach for their smartphones or even go on social media. Take a look at this. Drug traffickers use some of the best known social media platforms to advertise ads that disappear in 24 hours or in posts that are put up 
and then they're quickly removed. They use well-known code words and emojis to show what drugs they're selling along with other emojis that identify them as drug dealers. Now, after the buyer and dealer connect, payment is made using a one-click app, and the DEA calls it a one-stop shop and says adolescents and young adults are particularly susceptible because they use social media so very much. I mean, it, it's awful what's happening. So, so, Olga, you know, I heard about the social media content and I was sort of stunned to see the level of detail there. Uh, let me turn to Mr. Carroll. What should or can be done to crack down on drug trafficking like this on social media? So I started my career as a drug prosecutor in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And back then, you know, you sort of thought it was the, and a lot of truth to the fact that the drug dealer was on the street corner in the alley, you know, maybe behind the gymnasium at school. And today they're online. Um, the reality is, of course, they're still out on the street, but now they're everywhere. And so we have to make sure that we're going after these traffickers where they are. And social media has a huge responsibility to make sure that their environment is as safe as possible um, and make sure that they are doing everything they can to vet the people that are allowed access to these platforms. But really it's like what everyone here is saying, which is parents have a responsibility to talk to their children about the dangers of what's out there. And while we need to hold these um, companies accountable and make sure that they are doing everything they can we also have to recognize that were we to you know, completely eliminate social media today, these drug traffickers would find a new way of communicating you know, with our children tomorrow. And so cutting off the source of fund, getting the money from these um, organizations, while at the same time working with all of these you know, apps and other ways that children are in touch with each other these days um, is crucial. But I have to say that, you know, kids use social media today, it can also be a platform for distributing education, for making sure that kids understand the dangers. And I don't think we're gonna get rid of social media. And so now we have to learn, how do we live with it? How do we make it safe? And how do we actually use it for something good? Maybe, so going on social media and finding out where naloxone um, is available, um, things like that. That's where, you know, perhaps some of this could come in and actually um, be used in a positive manner. Good We've got there. another question coming in on yes. Facebook. Yes, we got right? lots of questions. Let me get to this one. This viewer writes, which demographic are most of these overdoses mainly happening in? Specifically, how high are the homeless populations on that list? Great question. Great question. Let me go back to Mr. Carroll. Your answer. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to turn this one to Dr. Lab. I think, you know, being on the front line in California, <laughs> um, she's in the emergency department yeah. more than I am. Well, the, whoever wrote in on Facebook is really spot on, and they're, they're right, that the homeless population is disproportionately uh, affected in these deaths. We know that. I cannot give you a number, um, but, but you, are, you are correct. I mean, the deaths of all society, as we heard um, in the videos with Josh and, and your people calling in, but, but the statistics does show that the homeless are more disproportionately affected in these deaths. Thank you so much. I have another question uh, from a viewer on Facebook, and they write, Dr. Zinner, this encompasses so much, and caring for the afflicted costs so much as well. You would think it would be targeted like COVID. Must be many that are benefiting from this horror. Dr. Borenson, can, can you help us with this one? Dr. Borenstein. Dr. Borenstein. What? I, I'm, I didn't understand the question. They're just talking about how this whole thing is just uh, encompassing so much this? and who's benefiting from this. Right, drug traffickers, obviously. Yeah, yeah. It, it's, these are the drug traffickers. These are the criminals who are poisoning our loved ones. And, you know, our country has a lot of divisions. We all know it. We see it every night on the news and read it in the newspaper. This is one thing that we all can agree on. This affects everybody. And this is ruining families' lives. This is taking away our young people from us. We all could agree on this, that we need better enforcement to block these things from, from coming to our children. We need better treatment that's available for everybody. This is one thing that really can unite all of us no matter what political side we're on, we're all in agreement on this. We need to stop this and come together for this. So while the criminals are benefiting, 
maybe on the other side of the coin, we all could benefit by coming together to fight this terrible, terrible situation. And that's such a great point, Dr. Zinner, what Dr. Bornstein just said. You know, this is something that we are all on the same page. Dr. Aris, I saw you nodding. I'd like your thoughts on this as well. No, definitely. I mean, I think it affects everyone. I think we've all known someone that has been affected um, by fentanyl, by the opioids. I mean, obviously, us that are on the front lines, we see it much more, but I think it affects anyone. It doesn't matter your social economic situation, um, your education. Um, now we're seeing it with young kids. I think it's something that affects all of us, and we do really need to start talking to our kids early and often. You know, I'm the mother of two teenage boys, and we're having these hard conversations all the time. And just really look out for signs. You know, if there's any change in behavior, any academic things, you know, always be alert. You know, what is going on? What is happening? Um, so um, lots of conversations, lots of preventive. Um, and, and just talking to them, you know, that this is a danger. And, you know, you can't believe drug dealers. That's why I tell my patients all the time. They're not going to tell you the truth, right? So um, they only care about their money. That's it. So be aware and... and and, you know, and get help. If you have a problem with substance, get help. There's good help out there. Thank you so much. Uh, another great question here that I'd like to toss to one of our panel experts. Uh, will fentanyl test strips be government funded as it becomes legal in Florida and similarly to Narcan? You know, there are <clears throat> several on the panel that could answer that question. One of them, Dr. Lev, and, and then Mr. Carroll, because of the government question. Dr. Lev, let's start with you. So fentanyl test strips, first let's explain what that is. So, yeah, so I wanna, let's start with explaining what a fentanyl test strip is. The fentanyl test strip, it works kind of like a COVID test or a pregnancy test. It's used to test powder or pills to see if there's fentanyl in there or not. It's helpful to people who are, think that they bought some cocaine or they thought they bought a Xanax pill or Adderall pill um, um, or even marijuana um, and make sure that there isn't fentanyl in it. Um, fentanyl uh, test strips are available on the internet. You could uh, buy them. I want to distinguish that from fentanyl testings in a hospital setting uh, because one of the laws we passed recently in California um, makes sure that any urine drugs test done in a hospital setting on people, not on the drugs, but on people who are affected, includes fentanyl. One study show, showed that only 5% of all overdose patients who reach a hospital are tested for fentanyl. So now we have all hospitals in California that include fentanyl in um, a drug test in the hospital. The state of Maryland did the same, and maybe out in Florida they could do the same thing. So before we leave the subject of test strips, you know, we declared COVID a public health emergency. Mr. Carroll, is it possible we could declare this a public health emergency and also have government support for things like test strips? Yeah, um, we actually have declared it. Um, we've declared opioids, um, and of course, fentanyl is a type of opioid. We've already declared it a national emergency um, under President Trump, and so it, that remains in effect. And it does allow some marshalling of resources. It does allow for the ability of some agencies to work together. Thankfully, um, being having the uh, bully pulpit a little bit at the White House and overseeing the 17 federal departments and agencies that are working on this issue, we were able to really make sure that we did have a unified approach. And, you know, you mentioned fentanyl test strips. That is just one of the tools that we're talking about. There's no, you know, single cure. Um, certainly test strips are um, an option that can be used to save lives. Um, Dr. Lev, as always, is incredibly humble. Um, she talked about the law in California that now requires fentanyl testing. Um, that was led essentially single-handedly by Dr. Lev to get it passed to make sure that people who are presenting themselves in emergency departments are properly tested. And it requires all of these types of approaches to make sure that we're getting testing at the upfront, we're getting quality treatment. Um, I really dislike the term and you'll hear it, how many beds were available. I, I hate that term, especially as a parent. It's not just how many beds were available, but what are the quality of the beds that are available? Um, and so there's so many parts of this um, that I do think that is such a nonpartisan issue that all of us you know, need to remain engaged and continue to work on this issue. Dr. Bornstein, we heard about harm reduction to help with the fentanyl crisis using community-driven strategies to reach people with addiction. Can you briefly, briefly tell us about it and what 
some of these strategies are. Yes, harm reduction is an approach that, you know, our first choice is for somebody to fully be in recovery, not use drugs anymore. As Jim has described, his daughter is in recovery for six years. That's choice number one. But sometimes we can't get there right away, or we can't get there. Harm reduction aims to reduce the risk, reduce the problems that are associated with the ongoing drug use, maybe to get the person to use less of it, to be more careful about it, whether it be testing it with the strip to make sure that it's not laced with fentanyl, um, to make sure that if they are taking a drug, they don't do it alone, that there's somebody nearby. Hopefully that person would have naloxone with them to save them if they have an overdose dose from fentanyl. There, so there are things that could be done to reduce the, the harm, that's the harm reduction, the harm of the drug use while acknowledging that at this point in time, the person may still be using the drugs. So Dr. Harris, let me uh, turn to a little bit of a different topic. We've learned over years and certainly during COVID that the underserved communities don't really trust government or healthcare providers so how can we reach them and ensure that they know the risks and the solutions to these issues? Yeah, and I think, you know, one of the strategies that we've um, implemented as a community is really getting grassroots, right? Because in these underserved communities that do not have the trust of the government, it's really about grassroots. It's about going to the churches, you know, the people that are trusted in that community and really starting there. So we've had some panels such as this in some of the communities um, in Dade County to really get the message out. Um, and it's something that has to be continuously being done. We have to really get the message out about the dangers, the fears, and where they can access treatment. Thank you so much. We have another question from Facebook. Carly uh, wants to know if the panelists would recommend that parents, Dr. Zinner, buy Narcan for their kids who may have an addiction issue. Let's start with Dr. Lev, but I'd like to go around and have everyone's opinion on this one. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Narcan, naloxone needs to be available around anybody who may be using drugs, any type of drugs. It doesn't matter what type of drugs. Naloxone works for opioid overdoses, but since we know fentanyl has infected the entire drug supply, you never know, and it should be handy. You know, in San Diego County, we have naloxone vending machines in schools jails and in public places. So yes, I do recommend that uh, for parents. I, I just want to add a little thing also. The message that we send to the public is different for different cohorts of population. There's a cohort of a population that has a substance use disorder. They have a drug addiction. The message there is that there's treatment with compassion, that it works, recovery is possible. Um, that's for that cohort. There's another cohort of kids who are not using drugs. Um, and for them, the message is good job. And there are more and more young people making the conscious decision to protect their brain until they're 25 years old and not be exposed to any type of drugs. So it's, it's uh, um, accepting the social norms and there's more people doing that. So there's hope. And then there's people who on occasion misuse drugs, any types of drugs. And for that, the message is fentanyl is in everything, and that's why we need Nixone. Dr. Ayers, and then Mr. Carroll, and then Dr. Bornstein. No, I mean, I couldn't agree more. 100%, uh, I think it should be in the hands of anybody that is using, and the family members. They should be educated on how to use it, have you know a number available to call fire rescue, um, because sometimes if, if it is a high dose of fentanyl, um, they might need an additional dose. Um, so um, just be very informed, and absolutely, I think it should be in the hands of everyone that's, that's using substances. And like I think Mr. Carroll said, in every first aid kit. Mr. Carroll? Yeah, um, thank you, Patricia, for, for remembering that, and that's the way I really believe it is. I mean, were you to ask someone, should you have a fire extinguisher at home? Um, you know, this is not a moral failure. We have to recognize that addiction is a disease. We've known that for decades. And 
just because we're asking you to keep a fire extinguisher at home, it doesn't, um, it's not because we believe you're a pyromaniac and that you're more likely to set fire to your house. It's what if, God forbid, there's a fire. The same thing should be true with naloxone, that God forbid, um, you know, should you see it out in the street? I, I'm going to hazard a guess that all of the fellow panelists like me carry it um, with you at all times. Um, it's in my backpack. It's in my car. Um, and the good thing is, and I think it's important for people to know this, and I, I'd love to, for some, some of the doctors to chip in, there's absolutely no danger in administering naloxone, even if the person is not having an overdose. So it's really, it's completely safe to use. Um, and that's one of the reasons it's going over the counter. And so I, I think one of the doctors should confirm um, what I'm saying as well. I, I think that'll be some comfort to parents out there. Yes. Dr. Bornstein, you're on. Absolutely. Yes, I, you're absolutely right. And that's an important point. Uh, it's safe to, to use, even if it's not needed. And I, and I would say, I would go along with the, with the panel, that everybody should have it, and we should use it as a teaching moment. So, for instance, Patricia, with your teenage boys, when you say why you have it, it's in case, God forbid, someone we know needs it. We all should be walking around with this. We should and make the point that, you know what, the reason we have to have it is because all of these drugs are now laced with this poison. So you may know your friend takes Adderall from a doctor and maybe you want to try it and you're going to buy it out in the street. Well, you can't do that anymore. That's not safe because you don't know what's in there. And it should be a teaching moment for, for all of us. Absolutely. Uh, we're almost out of time, but before we get to final thoughts, I have one quick question that just came in. And Dr. Lev, I'm going to give it to you. Uh, this viewer is asking, uh, should it be available in airports, schools, office buildings, et cetera? Your thoughts? You know, we have AED machines everywhere in case of a heart problem. We should have naloxone in areas where there are potential overdoses. So, yes, I think that should be, you know, the same kind of container like we have for AED machines. We should have for naloxone and people should carry their own. Uh, smart audience questions. Thank you so much. Um, I want to get final thoughts from all of you. But, Can I? of course, Mr. Carroll, chime in. Yeah. Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. Um, I, what I also think, and this is one of the lessons I think we've learned from COVID, is we as a federal government should be able to work, and I'm actually working in D.C. to try to get some laws passed, that anyone should be able to call a government agency, call an entity, and have it mailed discreetly to your house. So not only, you know, do you need to, you know, not need to go to a vending machine, you know, or go to a, a library, you can actually just have it mailed to your house. We did that with COVID testing. Um, we can do that. Um, and I'm working, you know, to make sure that we can actually get some laws passed in the country that would allow um, it to be mailed directly to your home. And so I'd love some support on that. Dr. Ayers, uh, we are, we're, we're getting near the end of our time here. Your thoughts on what we were just talking about? Yeah, completely my support. You have all my support, uh, Jim. I think um, there's a lot of <laughs> stigma with substance use disorder. Um, and I think that might also be, you know, a deterrent for people getting help or even going to a pharmacy and, and saying, like, I need some naloxone because of the way they're going to feel or if they're going to look at them in a strange way. So I, I do agree with that. Um, I think, you know, the, the take home message also is, you know, there is treatment. It's available. Um, let's all work together to really, um, really make a dent in this crisis. And speaking of making a dent and uh, making a difference, I want to turn to Agent Skeffington, who we heard from throughout this hour, and here were his final thoughts. Listen. We encourage everyone, uh, uh, every family, every caregiver, every parent to have these discussions, to, to know how lethal these substances are, to know that um, a pill that you may encounter either on the street or, or uh, on social media uh, or online, uh, any of those type of pills are not safe. The only pill that's safe is the one that comes directly from your doctor or, or your pharmacy. We're time for final thoughts. We are, and we don't have that much time, but again, the soundbite that we heard about one pill can kill, that is still resonating within me. Dr. Aris, I've got about 20 seconds for final thoughts from you. 
Yeah, I mean, I th and I think that really is important. That one pill can kill. It could be just be that one time that you just get that one pill from that one friend at school, and that could be the last time you see your family. And I think that's really important for people to know. Mr. Carroll, um, there's a difference between addiction and the poisoning, and we have for those people that have an addiction. Um, as Jeff said, recovery is possible. I have that um, in my family, and I'm blessed. Um, for those who are overdosing, it's knowledge. It's making sure that they're aware, as Patricia said, mm -hmm. of the dangers that are out there. Thank you so much. Dr. Lev, we got about 20 seconds for final okay. thoughts from you, please. Fentanyl is the public health crisis of our times, and we need to tackle it with the same force as we did for COVID or monkeypox or other infectious diseases, addressing both the supply mm -hmm. side and prevention and treatment. Thank you so much, Dr. Borenstein. About 10 seconds, dear. A message of hope. I think the fact that we're having this conversation is going to save lives, and we need to continue to get that message across to everybody. What we learned is the opioid epidemic taught us a lot about drugs, and unfortunately, fentanyl has made these problems only worse. We learned a lot tonight, and there are issues now that we know that are possible and solutions that are hopeful. That's right. That's right. And I want to thank our panel for sharing their expert knowledge and opinion with us. And to our viewers, thank you so much for sharing your questions. I hope we answered all of them about fentanyl. Thank you. We hope to see you next time. And as always, on behalf of Dr. Zinner and myself, take care. Thank you to the Eunice Joyce Gardner Charitable Foundation for its leadership support of the Health Channel.